Uh, good afternoon or morning, everyone. Thanks for tuning in for our latest uh, episode. Welcome to the final episode of our CTE Without Limits summer video blog series. This series explores four of the foundational commitments that connect the principles of a new vision for career technical education that's supported by over 40 national organizations. And if you've seen some of our previous episodes, we've explored some of the other commitments related to equity, quality and collaboration through public-private partnerships. And you can go back and, re and review some of those previous episodes on Advanced CTE's blog. Today, we're gonna to be discussing the importance of actionable, transparent and trustworthy data in advancing the CTE Without Limits vision. This is a topic that has come up quite a bit over previous uh, episodes and focusing on data is critical to accurately measuring learner participation and outcomes in CTE programs. Within the CTE Without Limits vision, this foundational commitment encompasses not only the infrastructure, content, and connectivity of data, but also data literacy, which is the foundation of data-driven decision-making. And in realizing CTE Without Limits, data can create new frontiers for program quality and equity and ultimately learner success in the careers of their choice. So today I'd like to uh, thank and welcome our uh, partners who are gonna be uh, joining the discussion today. Uh, Brennan McMahon Parton, who's the Vice President of Policy and Advocacy for the Data Quality Campaign, and Scott Cheney, the CEO of Credential Engine. I'd like to give each of them a couple of minutes just to introduce themselves and talk about why they support the CTE Without Limits vision as it relates to data quality. So Brennan, why don't you go ahead and kick us off? Sure, thanks so much, Austin. Um, so glad to be here. And I'm so glad to hear that data has been a through thread in these conversations. Uh, we often say that data isn't a silver bullet, but you're not gonna improve, make systemic improvement, systemic changes without it. And I think that's really why we're so happy to support um, CTE Without Limits is because it is about systemic change. It's about using information to acknowledge and change practices that are gonna give more individuals, more students access to opportunities that lead them to life-sustaining careers. And um, that's great, that's good. <laughs> And then Scott, a word from you. Yeah, good afternoon, everybody. Uh, thanks so much for having us. We, we're thrilled to be a partner on the CTE Without Limits initiative. When you think about the importance of CTE as that real life connection between an individual's high school, early college experience, and their ability to examine and explore the whole world of opportunities in front of them, and knowing that they need to be able to make real world decisions about what offerings are gonna to lead to what outcomes are gonna to lead to good jobs, that's all data. That's all information they need to be able to access and sort through and make sense of so they can make the most important decisions of their lives in some cases. And having good data, having systems and partners that come around to make all of that more clear and more helpful to students, it was a no brainer, we had to be a part of this. Absolutely, and thank you both for, for joining us today for, uh, for this lively conversation. Uh, so Brendan, I'd like to kick off the first question to you. Um, so CTE is, is unique because it sits at the nexus of K through 12 education, post-secondary education, adult education, workforce development, and industry, which means that building systems that allow decision makers to accurately follow learners through their career pathways can be a major obstacle for state leaders. So what can states do to improve some of these cross-sector data linkages in order to better evaluate learner progress and outcome as they move along their education and career paths? And how close are we to having operational uh, P20W data systems that allow states to uh, create these kind of data linkages? Yeah, you've really hit on the challenge there. We used to use this in, this um, analogy in education of the leaky pipeline. That's not about students. It's about the policies and practices and systems that don't allow us to meaningfully ensure that we have the information that we need about students to about, about support them on their journeys. Um, and I'd, I'd love to start with your, your second question is, is how close are we? How close are states to having these types of robust systems? And 
you know, as per always, when we're talking about state policy and practice, there's 51 versions of, of the truth here. Um, different states are in different places and different moments of readiness. But the good news is that there are leading states and there are bright spots to, to look for. And, and we do think there's power in copy paste uh, when it comes to learning best practices and data, data systems. So state leading states like Kentucky that already have the strong building blocks, if, if not at least some of the information that you're describing that's needed already already. Um, and two other things I'll point out, good news is that really large states, both Texas and California, that have a tremendous amount of students and a tremendous amount of, of students of color, students of different backgrounds, both passed legislation in um, the sessions that sort of came to a close in the spring that are going to, um, in California's case, help them build a robust P20W data system, um, and in Texas's case, help them uh, better coordinate across that P through 20W pipeline. Um, and in both cases, in the sunshine with leaders at the table, you know, accountable for their decisions. And that's really what takes me to the first part of your question: is, is how do we do it? <laughs> um, how can we make this possible? And you know, DQC, we're really strong believers that. Every state, every single state, every single state needs to be focused on strong cross-agency data governance. Not a super cool thing to talk about, imperative to increasing the quality, access, trans trans transparency, and use of data in states. Um, and just for, for way of, of a definition, I'm, I'm not only talking about the policies and practices that happen within agencies, but this leadership level body, you know, heads of agencies that are required to share power, come to a table together, make decisions in the sunshine, um, you know, receive feedback from stakeholders critically, you know, there, it's both a forum for decision making and a forum for advocacy. And we just don't think that these kinds of, of robust data systems that you know, give us information about CTE systems, but answer many other policy questions that we have um, are, are, are possible without those, those types of data governance systems. And um, while of course there are infrastructure needs and challenges, we, we do need to focus on um, modernization and all that good stuff. It's actually the people and the political will challenges, which I know are the easiest ones um, that, are, that are the barriers to overcome right now for improving data systems. Great, thank you so much. And I think the three of us on this uh, call can all agree that cross-sector data governance is a fun topic to talk about, although I, I know it might not be the same for everybody. In good company today. Uh, Scott, <laughs> yeah. Uh, Scott, same question to you. What, how close do you think we are to, to building these systems and, and having that data transparency? Um, I, I really like Brennan's uh, term, you know, sunshine, like shining some light on, on what's happening. Yeah, thanks. So one of the exciting things we've done is to work with DQC to, to write some materials about how we can build on that really great state longitudinal data work that they've been doing for so long, which really centers on how individual students are progressing through and what their outcomes are and their pathways are. And to augment that by bringing to the table rich information about those things that they earn, right? The, the, the credentials that they're getting, whether it's an industry recognized certification, a, a certificate from a community college or employer, a badge, a license, anything that they could be earning and add that into the story about a student's progress. So we know that it's not just that you know, a subset of students are succeeding in this track of CTE or this program of study, but we know what they took and the skills and competencies that are embedded in that. And we can demonstrate how when you stack them the right way and you have them consciously and purposely building along a pathway that leads them to that two-year program in a community college or a four-year program or an apprenticeship or a good employment, we can see not just how individual students are progressing through a generic name of CTE, but we can see how the details are of what they've earned and how they are working together. So that is a relatively new concept. We've got about half the states that are working with us right now to publish that level of credential and skill and connection to job information. And when we marry that up with the individual records that, that students or that states are housing in these data, data governance systems, 
the ability to bring that literacy to the table is not only richer for the student, it's richer for the CTE administrator. It's richer for the faculty members. It's richer for the administrators. It's richer for everybody that needs to be helping think about how do we put the best programs in place to serve most people the most effectively. So I wanna talk a little bit more about um, kind of the mechanics of, of building these systems and ensuring that we're able to track uh, student progress through their career pathway. So we, we talked, you know, in the intro about how CTE leaders do this vision data in, in realizing this, uh, the goal for this vision and capturing learning that's happening across uh, the education conti continuum. Continuum. Um, data infrastructure is needed to, to document and evaluate and recognize through post-secondary credit, through credentials and other means, uh, the diversity of learning that's happening both in the classroom and outside of the classroom. And, and Scott, let's start with you and then uh, Brennan, if you could follow up after that. Sure, so, so this is where it's really important that we recognize when you talk about all of the learning that's happening, that it's more than just one system. So an individual student may be having learning experiences through their high school, through a community college, through a summer internship with an employer where they're earning a particular credential. They may be doing things on their own in self-study. There are so many different avenues that individuals are getting that learning that we have to have a very broad lens when we're thinking about where to capture data about all of the learning that an individual student is experiencing and all the skills that they're, that they're getting. So, when we're working with a state, we're working not only with their K-12 system, we're working with their workforce system, we're working with their state licensing bodies and their apprenticeship system, which may come through yet a different agency. Uh, we're certainly working with the employers in the region and the post-secondary system. So when we think about infrastructure, I think it's important, and, and back to the point you made at the start, CTE lives at that intersection between K-12, post-secondary industry, We've got to be thinking about getting all of them to the table to share information in secure ways when it's around individual student records, but in very open ways when it's around things that people are earning and learning so that we can give the best picture to that student to carry with them as they're navigating their own pathway through. So infrastructure is a very rich, very inclusive conversation when we think about these kind of pathways. Yeah, I really want to pick up on a, a, a thread Scott was weaving there, which data system silos follow the silos that we have in our institutions. So if right now it's already challenging for a student to be in K-12 and take courses in post-secondary and have an internship externally. Well, those same silos are going to be reflected in the in the work in the excuse me, data infrastructure that we have at forget the state level, just at the local level. Um, and so there need to, there need, this is why I go back to my point about these leadership level conversations. If what we're trying to solve is increase the number of high quality apprenticeships by 20% so that students have access on the immediately on the other side of high school, data systems, data infrastructure needs to follow the ability to answer that question. Um, and, and just really simply, I would say, you know, there's, there's a lot of information in K-12 systems, but the further you get away from that school experience, the less data points we have, the less robust questions that we can answer. I think that's particularly true in, in workforce systems. Um, and so there needs to be more policy levers, more policy leadership, but also um, just straight up dollar investments, both federally and state um, for state data systems to be able to modernize, upgrade and, and better reflect the realities of what we want to happen for students down in classrooms and in community colleges and in apprenticeships or whatever it may be. Austin, I just want to, I want to follow up with what Brennan just said there um, and, and pick up on that leadership question. One of the reasons that, that we're so thrilled that Advanced CTE is doing this work is because the state leadership is so vital. Because if we start talking about an individual school district or an individual community college district where CTE is happening, there's, there's a lot that has to be captured and, and reported and put into this infrastructure. 
But so much of an individual student's or worker's life isn't just from, isn't, isn't just experienced through institutions that may be locally based. It may be through a state university. It may be through an employer that is outside of that system. It may be through, um, you know, online programs that are issued by an institution three states over. Um, you know, if you're going to get an industry recognized certification, it's likely a national certification. So it's really important that, and I'm going to point to the state of uh, Connecticut that just passed a law that said that every credential issued in that state has to be made publicly transparent and have all that information be accessible. So regardless of where an individual student is getting that learning, we're able to capture what it is they've learned and the skills and competencies in it so that we can have that information follow that student, whether it's the University of, of Connecticut, whether it's a community college, or whether it's Southern New Hampshire University, or whether it's CompTIA or Microsoft, right? We've got to be able to have that rich information and that's state leadership. And that's something that, you know, state, CE, state CTE directors can really help to message in the state conversation about the value of that rich information to, have, to be able to help their programs improve. Yeah, sorry, I have to keep picking up on this because I'm so glad you, you started bringing up regional and cross state in my mind so I can, you know, use my own home state of, you know, I'm from Southeast Tennessee, can imagine completing a CTE course of study at a public school in Southeast Tennessee and then going to the University of Georgia. Right. Um, and we're seeing so many of states pass these um, right to know bills that are focused on helping students understand um, economic outcomes on the other side of post-secondary. But if you've got 10, 15% of your kids, which was true for my high school, going across the line to the University of Georgia instead of staying home, we've, we've lost those outcomes. And so um, it, state leadership also needs to talk to each other <laughs> about how we can better um, at very least ping systems and have you know, more regional perspectives on all these, like you said, nationally recognized credentials and others that, that may be happening outside of your neighborhood. <laughs> Yeah, absolutely. I, I really appreciate that reframing too. It's, it's not just about the technology infrastructure, which was a little bit where I was going with the, the question, but I think a better question is like, what is the policy infrastructure? What are the kind of softer elements that need to be in place for this work to uh, to be successful? And it's, it's leadership, it's having a, a, a conducive policy environment. It's ensuring that you have communication within and across states. Um, it's so much more than just kind of building the system. So I think that's a really important uh, reframing. Yeah, and so, I don't want to. I don't want to. I don't want to minimize the the need to get the technology and data infrastructure right. Right. I mean that that's no small question. Mm -hmm. But as, as Brennan said earlier, we've got great examples of Kentucky and Maryland and others who who know how to do this. Who've done it right bringing the, the actual technology, having the, the state uh, lead on the Maryland State Longitudinal Data Center talk to other states, that's almost the easier piece. It's getting that vision and the recognition you've got to have the right policies in place, the right data governance, not just in your state, but across states. That's the, really, that, that's the, the point that we're at right now, I think. Um, and again, not to minimize the complexities and the legal requirements of, of the technology pieces of the data. Um, but, but, you know, DQC has been doing that and they're experts in that and they can step in and help any state knock that out. Um, so I'm, I just signed you up for a lot of work, Brennan. Thank you, but, but plus one to that point, totally. <laughs> mm -hmm. So um, I, I wanna talk a little bit about the importance of uh, centering equity in uh, building data systems and using data, um, which again is, you know, another one of the core commitments of the uh, CTE without limits vision. So love to hear from each of you, how you think states can ensure that their data and accountability systems are being used to promote equitable access to CTE and ensure economic mobility for learners with low income, racially minorita minoritized learners, and other learners that have been historically underserved by the education system. Um, and uh, Brennan, let's start with you this uh, for this question and then uh, Scott, if you could follow up. 
Yeah, I'll admit, I, there's so many directions I, I could and, and want to go with this, but I'll, I'll try to drill down to just a couple. And one is the point that I was making before that the data systems, data infrastructure need to follow policy. Um, so if accountability is the lever that state leaders want to pull, which they're well entitled to and probably should, to have better information and better access to you know, all those groups of students that have been way too often left out of the kinds of opportunities we're describing, data systems need to follow and enable that disaggregation, making sure we have the right flags in the system, make sure your K-12 and your Perkins systems are talking to each other <laughs> might be a good place to start, being able to link those post-secondary and K-12 systems to get feedback. So, so that's one, you know, just like Scott was saying, I don't want to diminish um, the importance of investments in, and the time that it takes to improve data infrastructure, but policy absolutely must lead the way. So we need to be calling on our policy leaders to say, this is what we're holding ourselves accountable for. Um, you know, part of our constitutional education to deliver an adequate education up in this state is to, to meet the goals that you just laid out. Um, but, but second is, um, Going back to this concept of data governance, it, it doesn't always happen in the sunshine right now. And, and I, I don't mean that as a ding for the many hundreds of talented you know, data leaders across this country, but it, it's not always a, a, a set of practices that um, the public really gets to see in the sunshine, understand <laughs> and weigh in on. And so as we're pushing every single state to think differently about how they provide leadership level you know, accountable, transparent um, governance for their data systems, the a consideration of that also needs to be who gets a seat at that table. Um, and I talked a little bit at the beginning about the bill that California just passed in its most recent legislative session. That bill has the potential to be sort of a best in class example of data governance because they've said, yep, all the data owners across higher education institutions and K-12 leadership are going to be at the table. And we're also going to make space for people who aren't data owners to sit at this table and, and ask that, oh, really, question as they're having the conversations about what's most important and what needs to be prioritized. Um, so it, it's not just about having the meeting on a public calendar. It's about intentional design um, that finds the space to bring people you know, to the table. And I think a lot of state education agencies got a probably first in their life glimpse at stakeholder engagement at, at sort of a, a large level when they were working on ESSA plans and it was not easy for them, but let's maximize on the fact that they had to learn a new skill and think about how we can pull that into the ways we make decisions about data too. <laughs> Always an educator at heart, right? <laughs> so, so that th those are excellent points. And, and let me just tell you a little bit about how we're thinking of that question um, here at Credential Engine, where really our, our mission is to determine how to bring all essential information about credentials and their competencies and pathways and their transfer value and their links to jobs and their quality and their outcomes um, into a transparent, easily found, usable format for the open web. So when you talk about um, equity and, and we think about, <clears throat> excuse me, we think about not only which credentials are equitable and, and lead to good equitable outcomes, but more importantly, in, in many ways, people don't typically get a single credential, right? They get a set of credentials over their lifetime. They get a high school diploma. They get a, maybe a community college. They might get a certificate. They get a badge when they're on the job. How do we understand what we need to know about those stackable credentials, the stackability, the pathways that lead them to be positive in that equitable conversation. So what are the data points that we need to know in order to determine if a credential, a transfer recommendation, a pathway, a stackability is in fact equitable? Where does that data live? Who, who has those data points that help us make those determinations and how do we get that information public? And then once it is public and transparent and open, I'm almost as in, invested in understanding who's using that data to put it in front of a student. And that's more often than not a education guidance counseling system. It, it could be, you know, whatever you walk into in your high school for support in 
understanding what classes to take and what's important to go get into college or to get into this program or to get a job. So how are those platforms, those services and tools and companies using the data in ways that aren't unintentionally inequitable or leading people on inequitable pathways so they're not being served as well as they should be. So I think we have a lot of work to do in not just thinking about the finding the data, the getting it public, the making it accessible, but in making sure that it's not then being um, either intentionally or unintentionally you know, misused so that we're not helping those very students intended to help along the way be able to make the most of that information to help them find their best pathway to the best outcome. So there's a lot of questions on both sides of this equation, and we're beginning to think a lot about how can we play a role in both of those. That is such a great point. I also, we need to make sure that people have the information in front of them and that they're also not, um, ignorant to what the information tells them when they don't need to be. Um, yes. that, that there's there's time and space and ability and skills. You talked about data literacy at the top um, yeah. that school leaders, that community college leaders should have and probably currently don't have that would better allow them. And also incentives, I mean, we're talking about data following policy and incentives to make the kind of decisions that would ensure that underserved students have access to the highest quality credentials, the most high value CTE pathways. Um, and I didn't want to let <laughs> the conversation going by without picking back up on that data literacy thing, um, mm -hmm. which is also a culture change thing. So just, just to reiterate, we've laid out really hard challenges of political will, culture change, data infrastructure investment. <laughs> the fixes are not small, um, but, but in my mind, those three pieces are the equation um, on, on how we move this needle. <laughs> just, just to close that, I think we're at the moment where this can happen. Right, I think we're at the moment when there is a really rich and compelling and energetic conversation around how do we make sure people are getting the skill sets they need to both emerge from COVID, but to also recognize this is a moment to fix a lot of the problems that have been embedded in our education and training system for years. We have a rich conversation around the need to really address equity, and we can only hope that we're serious about it this time. And we have a lot of investments coming in because of the recovery into education systems where we have a moment to rally that political leadership, to make the investments in the right place, to put better data into people's hands. So if, if we're ever gonna find a moment when we can actually do exactly what CTE without limits is envisioning, this is it. And we have to all work together to make it happen. And Austin, that's Absolutely. your Absolutely. <laughs> <laughs> We're working on it. Uh, it also helps that we have such great partners who are with us in this effort. Um, and I think that's such an important note to close on. I mean, there, there's a reason why data is one of the, the foundational commitments of the vision. We didn't want to call it out as one of the principles because we think it, it should undergird every single one of the principles in the vision um, and informing, you know, Brendan, you're talking about data literacy, like ensuring that the educators and counselors and advisors and employers and, and everybody who is in that student's life um, as they're progressing along the career pathway has the information to, to support that student. The student is able to access that information um, and can use it to make informed decisions. So it's, it's not just about building the systems, but ensuring that the data is, is accessible, is being used, is informing uh, policy, informing uh, career and academic planning, um, and is just infused throughout the system. So I think that's a really good note to end on. Uh, just wanted to, again, thank each of you for joining us uh, for this uh, video blog. Um, we hope this episode has inspired uh, viewers to take the first steps to bring this vision to life. And you can visit Advanced CTE's website at the link uh, below for resources to educate partners about the vision and to begin the first steps towards implementation. So thanks everyone for, for tuning in for this uh, final episode in our series and really appreciate everybody for joining us. Thank you. Thank you.